wants to come on in and get situated we'll get started um, Bethany if you'll come on up here Jonathan as soon as you can brother you can you can kill the music we're gonna go ahead and get started here um, well we still have some other folks over there but that's what I was trying to do get everybody situated All righty. Well, good morning, everyone. Shabbat shalom. Shabbat shalom. Hope everyone's doing well this morning. Um, the weather still can't make up, its mind, make up its mind if it wants to be warm or cold. I'm ready for spring. I don't know about anybody else, but I'm ready for it. Um, I want to say something before I forget about it. And I, I don't have all the details straight, but I just wanted to say congratulations to Zuriel Losi. He had a, a, a big blessing this week, and uh, it looks like his gift for design and other, uh, other gifts that he possesses is opening up some doors for him. So we just want to say congratulations, Zuriel, and, and we're just going to be praying with the Father's will in this that it, it comes to pass. So I just wanted to say that before we go. All righty. Well, if everyone would stand, we're going to pray, and then we'll have Matovu. Hallelujah. <laughs> All right. Join with us. Our Father in heaven, God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, Father, we thank you for this day that you have set apart, that you have blessed. We thank, we thank you, Father, for the opportunity for us to come together with those who are like-minded, those who are seeking your face, those who are searching for your will in their life. And we thank you for this opportunity to commune with you and to, to commune with one another. And our prayer today from the depths of our heart is that everything of this past week and everything in the coming week will be set aside for this time so that we can focus our energy, our attention, our affections upon you that we would know that your presence is with us today. We invite you, Father, to abide with us today, to be with us, to remove every obstacle that would impede whatever it is you wish to do in our lives today. And we pray, Father, that your peace, your shalom, would descend upon us now. And that as we praise, as we pray, as we sing, as we share, that everything that is done will be pleasing in your sight. Everything that is done will lift up the name of Yeshua, our Messiah. Everything that is done will be to edify, to encourage, and to provoke us all to draw closer to you today. We pray that every, every challenge that we have had to endure this week, Father, that you would encourage and enable us to lay that aside now. And we just pray, Father, that your perfect will be performed today and that you would bless our fellowship, not only with you, but with one another. We pray these things and we believe you for these things because we come to you in the name that is above all. 
Yeshua, our Messiah and Redeemer. Amen? Amen. And I'm uh, Amen. And let's just continue. I'm trying to talk way before my mouth's ready. <laughs> See, obviously, I just proved that point again. Everybody, let's just stand for Matovu. Matovu. Oh, Call to worship with the sound of the shofar. Go ahead and come on up. All right. Shabbat Shalom, everyone. Shabbat Shalom. Y'all can do better than that. Shabbat Shalom. There it is. There's so many of y'all. Only one of me. Well, two of me. Three, three of me. That baby's showing more and more, y'all. I cannot wait. All right, let's sing. Shabbat Shalom. Shabbat Shalom. Shabbat 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 Shalom Shabbat Shalom Shabbat Shalom Shabbat 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 Shalom Shabbat 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 Shalom Shabbat 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 Shalom Shabbat Shalom Shabbat Shalom Shabbat 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 Shalom Shabbat Shalom Shabbat Shalom Shabbat 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 Shalom Shabbat 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 Shalom Shabbat 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 Shalom Shabbat Shalom Shabbat Shalom Shabbat 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 Shalom 
Shabbat Shalom, Shabbat Shalom, Shabbat 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 Shalom, Shabbat 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 Shalom, Shabbat 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 Shalom, Shabbat Shalom, Shabbat Shalom, Shabbat 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 Shalom, Shabbat Shalom. Shabbat Shalom, Shabbat 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 Shalom. One more time. Shabbat Shalom, Shabbat Shalom, Shabbat 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 Shalom. Name at so who man I Shabbat Shalom. I was waiting on the dancers, y'all. He <laughs> Behold how good and how pleasant it is for brothers to dwell together. Behold how good and how pleasant it is for brothers to dwell together in unity, in unity. La 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 la. In unity, in unity. La 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 la. la. Here goes real. He named my tohu manai. Shevet achim gav yachai. He named my tohu manai. Shevet achim gav yachai. He named my tohu. He named my tohu. La 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 He ne ma to he ne ma to La 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 Behold Behold how good and how pleasant it is Brothers to dwell together Behold how good and how pleasant it is For brothers to dwell together in unity, in unity. La 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 la. In unity, in unity. La 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 la. One more time. Behold how good and how pleasant it is for brothers to dwell together. Behold how good and how pleasant it is for brothers to dwell together in unity, in unity. La 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 la. In unity, in unity. La 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 la. He ne, he ne imato humanai. Shevet achim gam yachai, he neima tohu manai. Shevet achim gam yachai, he neima tohu, he neima tohu. La 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 la. He neima tohu, he neima tohu. La 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 la. La 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 la. ready to praise him this morning oh we're gonna bless your holy name Lord and the reason we're here 
You're the reason that we're together today. Oh, 
praise is a weapon. My 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 praise, my praise is a weapon. 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 My dance 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 is a weapon. My shout is a weapon. My shout is a weapon. Filled with this 
I can't get enough No, I can't get enough Of your amazing love No, I can't get enough No, I can't walk away I can't walk away For I have seen your face No, I can't walk away And I just want to be where you are I just want to be near your heart And there is nothing like your love And there is nothing like your love I just want to be where you are Oh, I just want to be where you I just want to be near your heart But there is nothing like your love There is nothing like your love Can't get enough Oh, I can't get enough Oh, I can't get enough Your unfailing love. No, I can't get enough. And I can't walk away. No, I can't walk away. For I have seen your face And I can't walk away I just want to be Oh, I just want to be where you are And I just want to be near your heart there is nothing like your love And there is nothing like your love I just want to be where you are oh, I just want to be where you are And I just want to be near your heart there is nothing like your love Yeshua, there is nothing like your
sing holy.
just take a moment and just talk to him, sing to him, commune with him. Father, we thank you that you've allowed us to come to this place to honor you, to adore you, to worship you. And Father, I pray that what flows from our heart will come up before you and be pleasing to you. May you receive it as our wholehearted invitation for you to come into each and every life and family and in this, this assembly to have your way, to do what you will in your people. We want you to abide with us today. And so we, we acknowledge that you are holy, that there is none beside you. Just sing the chorus once more for me, please. Are you glad that he let us be here today? Amen. Everyone can just remain standing as we uh, do our liturgy. Those of you who have been waiting in the hallway for all this time, if you want to come in here with us, we'll try to accommodate you just the very best we can. But as many as want to be in here, I want you to want to just take just a second and let you come in here. So we used all the black chairs, then we used all the blue chairs, and now we're bringing out the white chairs. Wow. All right. All right, so is everyone that wants to be in here while we when we do this in here? All right, everyone. Let's all stand for the Bishamru. Please recite it with me. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Speak thou also unto the children of Israel, saying, Verily my Sabbaths you shall keep, for it is a sign between me and you throughout your generations that ye may know that I am the Lord that doth sanctify you. 
Wherefore, the children of Israel shall keep the Sabbath to observe the Sabbath throughout their generations for a perpetual covenant. It is a sign between me and the children of Israel forever. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, and on the seventh day he rested and was refreshed. Then one of the scribes came, and having heard them reasoning together, perceiving that he had answered them well, asked him, which is the first commandment of all? And Yeshua answered him, the first of all the commandments is, Hear, O Israel, the Lord, hear, o Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. And you shall love the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all of your soul, with all of your mind, and with all of your strength. This is the first commandment. And the second like it is this. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. There is no other commandment greater than these. Shema Yisrael Adonai Eloheinu Adonai Echad Baruch Shem The Lord our God, the Lord is one. Blessed be his name and his glorious kingdom forever. Amen. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. And upon these two commandments stands a whole lot. Love your neighbor, love your God. They are have time. They are Brethren, if we could get the hoopa out here. Let's let them get the hoopa first, and then we'll ask our young men and women and boys and girls to come up here. Takes 10 of you to do that. <laughs> all right. Can we have all of our boys and girls and young men and women gather just as tightly under the hoop as you can?
I think the quiver is full today. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Everyone extend your hand toward our children. And as we do that, we pray over and say the blessing over the children that are here. We remember our children that are not with us and our grandchildren that are not with us and those that are far off, not only in distance, but in their relationship with the Father right now. And we pray this blessing over them all. May the Lord protect and defend you. May he always shield you from shame. May you come to be in Israel a shining name. Father, we thank you so much for the blessing that we have represented here, the children, the future. I just pray that you would, as we have saying, that you would guard them, that you would keep them, and you would prepare them, that you would bless them, and that as they're taught in this age, that they would, hard, they would harbor these things in their hearts, they would learn, and they would keep your word in their heart, that they would grow and not forget it. You prepare them for what's in store. Thank you once again for the bountiful blessing that you've given us, that our quiver is beyond full to overflowing. Such a blessing. Our cup runneth over. I thank you for these things in your name. Amen. 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 Thank you, young men and women. You can return to your seats. Thank you, gentlemen. All right, we're going to take just a moment here as we're transitioning to make certain that everybody has its seat. And if you are in Jacob's Quiver and your mom and dad are okay with it, Jeremy is going to be in the overflow room here. And so as many of you who wouldn't mind doing that, go sit in there. And... We don't want you having to sit in the floor because what we want to do, we have a lot of guests here that today and we would like to do our utmost to try to find them a place to sit down. So if you, if it's okay with mom and dad, that would be wonderful. However, just remember, it's you're just overflowing into the air. It's still part of the service, okay? Not playtime. So Jeremy will be in there. Thank you, Jeremy. And now we're going to kind of get some chairs here so we can get everyone seated. I guess while we're doing that, Bethany, why don't you come up here and you greet everybody that's visiting via live stream. Well, good morning, everyone. And hi to everyone on the live stream. When we were coming in this morning... Um, I have a Facebook and I get requests all the time, but I, I don't really do anything on it at all. But today I jumped on to uh, the Jacob Streamer page 
you guys have a lot of fun on there. I just got to say, if y'all don't check it out, you need to go check out the Jacob Streamer page because when we're through here, they carry on and they have a good time. There was some stuff on there that really gave me a good laugh, some good, clean fun on there. And not only that, but to see everybody encouraging each other on there. So I encourage you. You're not streamers if you're here, obviously, but you can be because I've had to be when I couldn't be here. So jump on there and check it out. But we just want to say hey to everybody online and everybody here. They are a huge part of Jacob's tent. You have no idea all the stuff that goes on. I wish I could just, I could write books already. So anyway, um, does everybody have a seat who wants to be in here? Okay, y'all are looking. I talk books, right? <laughs> I talk a lot, I know. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. All right, so are we good out there, Robert, as far as everybody? We're good? Okay. So we've got some seats that have opened up back here if you guys want a little more comfortable chair. But if you're good, you're good. All right? Well, uh, I, as they say, I guess that's a good problem to have, right? Amen. Thank you, the two of you who said that. Amen. We appreciate it. <laughs> All right, we're... We're still kind of getting situated here. Thank you so much. Thank you, Melody and Brandon, for leading us in worship today. All right. Are we good? All right. He's pointing at you. You wanted to you wanted to do something. Come on. I, I well you you explain to them what you had on your heart to do. What I have in mind is uh, before we start the service today for uh, ten or more adult men to come up front here with me. Let's encircle Bill and uh, pray over him today. Uh, before he starts his message. Today's um, Torah portion speaks of anointing oil being used to pour over the priest and the leaders. And uh, we'd like to anoint Bill that uh, today the Holy Spirit's message would flow through his mouth, not of Bill, but of God. If I could get uh, 10 or more men to come up here and join me. Father, with this oil, we do ask for your Holy Spirit to pour out on Bill this day, Lord, to just give him strength beyond his own strength, to give him words beyond his own words, Lord, that uh, your message, your love, and your power would just pour out through Bill. And Father, I pray that uh, you would give him uh, strength beyond um, his own abilities, uh, Lord, as he, he is leading this uh, congregation for just over a year now, Lord, we watched it grow. Uh, we watched Bill and his entire family pour out their lives into this place, Lord. And I pray that you would protect them as the, uh, the fiery darts do sometimes come, Lord. Just give them the strength to go on. And I'd like everyone here to uh, just lift your hand. And if God gives you something to speak, to just go ahead and speak it. God can hear 20 people at a time. If he gives you anything to say, just speak it over Bill and his family at this time.
And Father, as we recite every week that uh, we are to love the Lord our God and to love our neighbors as ourselves, show us, Lord, each how to uh, be better at loving our neighbors as ourselves, Lord, to let the uh, little things go, to be able to move on and to do your work. In Yeshua's name, amen. Thank you, brethren. So I was asked if I mind a bunch of men praying for me. And I said, nope. <laughs> I'm all for it. <laughs> thank you so much. And thank you for the prayers of this congregation, including those of you who are out there watching this via live stream. Thank you, guys. That means a lot. It really does. All right, we're going to go to our Torah portion. It's uh, in Exodus chapter 27. It begins in verse 20. It's called Tetzalveh. And you shall command. And I'm going to read verses 20 and 21 as we begin. It says, And you shall command the children of Israel that they bring you pure oil of pressed olives for the light to cause the lamp to burn continually in the tabernacle of meeting outside the veil which is before the testimony. Aaron and his sons shall tend it from evening until morning before the Lord. It shall be a statute forever to their generations on behalf of the children of Israel. So in this Torah portion, it gets into a lot of the particulars as it relates to the priests, their consecration, their, uh, the different garments, the different components of the Mishkan that interact with the priests or the priests have uh, responsibility to tend to. And so I was, as I was looking through this, I thought, boy, it would be nice just to focus on that, but it would also be nice just to focus on that. But it would really be nice to focus on this aspect of things. So I thought what I would do is I would just kind of blend them all together and uh, look at some of the patterns that are in this Torah portion as it relates to the priest with the understanding that in Messiah, you and I are regarded as a royal priesthood. And so these, these principles, these patterns apply. Yes, ultimately, speaking of Messiah, who is our high priest... But if we are in him, then whatever he is, is what we are supposed to be. I've said that many, many, many times. As the head of the body, what is emanating from the head flows through the body, affects the body, transforms the body. So the Mishkan or the tabernacle, which has kind of been um, the emphasis here for a few weeks or a couple of weeks, the Mishkan was a reminder that Israel's call is to be a holy nation, to be set apart unto the Creator. And now we have a little bit more, uh, some more specifics as it relates to the priests, their garments, those unique duties that spoke to how they were to represent Israel to the Most High and how they were to represent the Most High to the rest of Israel. And then, of course, there were repercussions as far as the nations. But again, Peter said that you and I are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, and we have a duty to perform. And that is that we are to show forth the praises of him who's called us out of darkness into his marvelous light. Paul says that we are temples of the Holy Spirit, and as such, we are to, like the priests, we're to be set apart in that we are not to be contaminated with the things of this world and polluted by the things of this world. Of course, we know how easy that is to do, right? Well, it's, it's a struggle at times. So we are to keep our hearts pure, and we are to keep our garments clean. In Revelation chapter 16, Messiah says, Behold, I am coming as a thief. Blessed is he who watches, who's alert, who's sober-minded, and keeps his garments, guards them, protects them, lest he walk naked and they see his shame. In Psalm 24, it says in verse 3, Who may ascend into the hill of the Lord, or who may stand in his holy place? And just in the natural, in the days of the sanctuary, the answer to that would be the priests. Because who would ascend the hill of the Lord? Who would, in fact, stand in his holy place? It were those who, had, who were in the priesthood, who had been set apart and consecrated for the priesthood. But the psalmist goes on to say, It's the one who has clean hands, and a pure heart who has not lifted up his soul to an idol nor sworn deceitfully. Now, there are, there are many words in Hebrew that are translated as pure. In this particular verse that we just read in Psalm, it's the word bar, betresh, like in bar mitzvah, which is also the word for wheat. It's also the word for sun, but it's, 
It's pure. But in what we just read earlier in the Torah portion, that they were to bring this pure oil, the Hebrew word is zach. And I think uh, for those Hebrew students, I think we've got that to show you there. It says zayin chaf zach. And this particular word means something that is clean. It is transparent. You can see through it. It's uh, crystal clear, as it were. And so this is the kind of oil that was to be used in the menorah. No foreign substance, no sediment was to be contaminating this particular oil, which then infers that the oil from that olive, well, the olive hasn't been crushed, it's been pressed, it's been squeezed. It's not a violent pressure, it's a gentle pressure, but enough to break the flesh of that olive so that it will exude this pure, uncontaminated, no sediment, no pollutants, the oil that is going to be used in the menorah. So then, that becomes the fuel for the light that was mentioned here. Taking that concept and applying it to you and to me, the priesthood was to remain pure. We weren't, again, the priesthood was not to be contaminated by certainly by the nations, but to some degree, the priesthood couldn't be contaminated by the rest of their own nation. They were to be safeguards of those things that were holy. Let's put it this way. It's something else that I've said many times. The priesthood represents those who were set apart from those who were set apart from those who were set apart. <laughs> Israel was set apart from the nations. The tribe of Levi was set apart from the other tribes. But then the Kohanim, the, the sons of Aaron, were set apart from the, the Leviim. So they were the set apart from the set apart from the set apart. And the difference is this, how close you can get to the Creator. What is your proximity to the Creator? And so we, we all want to draw close to Him. We want to be intimate with Him. We want to be one with Him. That's the goal. That's what we're striving for, Right? We can do better than three amens right there. <laughs> That's what we're striving for. So in a sense, what we're, what we're talking about here is being set apart from those who are set apart from those who are set apart. That is not to question anyone's relationship with the Father. It is just to say that some people will be quite content to remain in the courtyard. Some people want to go beyond the courtyard, but once... But when it comes to going beyond that veil where the presence is, there is a lot that has to be given up. There's a lot that has to be sacrificed as far as our will. So the priesthood is representative of that. So the point, I guess, would be here at the beginning is if we are considered to be a priesthood, then some of these instructions, the principles and the patterns that are contained in these instructions given them carry the same weight for you and for me. We have to, if we're going to be someone that is in close proximity to his presence, we're going to have to determine that we are going to remain undefiled. We're going to have to purpose in our hearts that we're not going to allow the things that pertain to Babylon to pollute us. It's like Daniel, Hananiah, Meshach, and Nazariah in Daniel chapter 1. They were brought into Nebuchadnezzar's academy, but they were, and when they were offered the king's meat and his wine and all these things, they purposed in their heart that they would not allow these things to pollute them. And that's going to play a very important role in decisions that they have to make later on in, in Daniel chapter 3 when the government is coming in and saying, bow or die. You don't just wake up one day and decide, I'm going to be undefiled. It is something that you've already determined in your heart. And test after test after test has come to put you in a situation where you demonstrate whether or not you really mean that. I think a lot of us can identify with that idea. So then we must be willing to be placed in the master's press and allow him to squeeze and to press in order to produce that pure oil, that clear, that transparent oil. The, it doesn't even have any sediments in it. The light of the menorah, of course, was to be perpetual, that is to say continuous. It was to never go out, and thus in Hebrew it's called ner tamid. Why don't you show them that, Jonathan, if you don't mind. Ner is the word for lamp, and tamid is perpetual, continuous, ongoing. 
And that is descriptive of the menorah. And so, consequently, in the tabernacle, Aaron and his sons were to make certain that there was always a lamp burning. But, you know, you have wicks that cause the fire, causes soot, and oil begins to be used up. And so you have to replenish these things. And so they would go in and they would clean the lamps in the morning. They would set the wicks and then they would lamp, uh, light the lamp in the evening. But again, there always was to be at least one lamp burning, thus ner to mead. Now juxtapose that against what we see in 1 Samuel 3. This is in the days of Eli the high priest, or Eli if you prefer. Eli the high priest, his two sons, Hophni and Pincus, who it said that they were sons of Belial, and they did not know the Lord. And what did they wear to work every day? The priestly garments. What was their duties each and every day? To attend to those things related to the tabernacle and to the presence. And, and so it just goes to show us that you can wear the priestly garments, you can go through the motions, and never know the Lord. That is a tragedy. But that's exactly what we see in the days of Eli, the high priest. And so if it says in 1 Samuel chapter 3 that the, in those days the lights of the menorah were beginning to go out, it would imply that they were beginning to be extinguished. And if you consider that menorah, the menorah is a picture not only of the Messiah, but it's a picture of Israel. The emblem for Israel today is the menorah, and it's flanked on either side by two olive branches. Now, my opinion is a wild branch and a natural branch. But the point is that is the emblem for Israel because Israel is called to be what? According to Isaiah 42, he said, I've called you in righteousness to be a light to the Gentiles. Yeah, that's speaking of the Messiah. But once again, whatever the Messiah is, that's what we're supposed to be. Agreed? So we are called to be a light. So in the days of Eli and the high priest uh, and Hophni and Pincus, the light was going out. And the Creator could not allow that to happen. So before he dealt, you know, definitely dealt with Eli and his two sons, he already had somebody waiting in the wings a young man by the name of Shmuel. Because when his mother Hannah conceived, she realized that the Creator had heard her cry. He had heard her prayer. He heard me. And I've often wondered if we couldn't also look at Shmuel or Samuel as hinting at this, that he heard God. Because one night, the Creator called out to him, and he said, I hear you. Here I am. I'm ready. So he already had somebody waiting the wings is the point. Because the light was going out. And so he had to find someone that he could work through to make sure that light never went out. That that light could be rekindled so that Israel's purpose on this earth could be fulfilled. To be that light in the nations. And since that time, the light has ebbed and flowed. Sometimes it's burned brighter, sometimes it hasn't burned very bright at all. I will leave it to you to conclude how you see that right now. How brightly God's people are burning in the earth today. In consideration of some of the things that are gaining ground every day in this world, it makes me wonder just how effective we're being and how we're fulfilling our purpose in this day and time. But still, even though it is dimmed at times, it has never all the way been never been extinguished all the way. The light, the menorah, of course, was that seven branch lamp stand. And because one of these lamps was to always burn, there's a lot of traditions that go along with this. I'm not going to get bogged down in all that today, but the one lamp that was to always burn was distinguished as being the shamash. And the shamash, of course, is the servant lamp. Now today, you know, we, when we have Hanukkah, we have that one lamp that sticks out above everybody else. You know, we call that the shamash lamp. And we, that light is first. 
and then we take that light and then we illuminate all the other branches. But that one lamp was understood to be the shamash, whichever one it was. Some say it was the western lamp, some say it was the middle. Again, I won't get into all that, but the point is, the one that was the neder to me, the one that was to never go out, would be the shamash. It would be the servant lamp. And it would serve the other branches by providing light for them. Now, uh, some of you may know this. I know that Marcy already knows this. I have to be on my P's and Q's today because I have a Hebrew scholar, a real Hebrew scholar here with us today. But the word shamish, shin mem shin, is, can also be pronounced shemish. And shemish is the Hebrew word for sun, as in S-U-N. So there's some hints there as well. That this eternal light, this light that never goes out, that is a servant branch, is also tied to the idea of that heavenly body that generates its own light and is going to be the servant in that it is going to provide light for all the other branches. So, I want us to consider that when Yeshua appeared to John on the Isle of Patmos, it said that he stood in the midst of the seven golden candlesticks. And I've seen a lot of different uh, artist renderings of what that may have looked like, but here is how Bill sees it. In the midst of the seven golden candlesticks would put him in the center of that menorah. And when John saw him, he fell down like a dead man. Why? Because he was shining. He was bright. He was brilliant, in fact. And so it's, I'm convinced that the shamish branch, obviously, is to point us to Yeshua, that he is the light that never is never extinguished. But he is the light that allows you and I to shine that we can be what he has called us to be. In this Torah portion, we see that Moses is singled out to perform three specific tasks, and I find them interesting. One is the preparation of the oil. The other is the selection of the priests. And then it's the selection of those who would make garments and build the mishkan. Before that, Moses had given instructions to other people but here, he is the one who specifically attends to these duties. Again, the preparation of the oil, because the oil is going to be very important by the time we get to the end of the teaching. The preparation of the oil, the selection of the priests, those who are set apart from those who are set apart from those who are set apart. And then selection of the people who are going to take these things that have been given to him in a pattern and turn them into a reality. That is the construction and the building of the tabernacle and the making of the garments. So that's interesting because Moses is a picture of Yeshua, our Messiah. He prepares the oil. How does he do that? Well, he puts you and I in situations where we are pressed. Would you agree with that? Yes. But he's not intending to crush us. He wants to press us, and there is a difference because he wants us to produce that pure, uncontaminated oil that is going to be the fuel for the light that collectively we are supposed to be. He is going to be the one who chooses those who are his priests. He, he said to his disciples, you didn't choose me, I chose you. So he chooses those that are called according to his purpose. And then, of course, again, Peter later on says that we as his body are a chosen generation. And then, keeping with the pattern here, he is the one who selects. He's the one that he is he's going to choose who he invests the wisdom to build his house in. He is going to make those decisions. So that's one of the patterns that we see here in this Torah portion. That Yeshua is the one doing the appointing. He's the one doing the selecting. He's the one doing the choosing. He's also the one doing the pressing. And this is just Bill's opinion. It would seem to me that those who are willing to submit themselves to the pressing will probably determine what category they fall in in those other situations. Because he's not going to do it against our will. Would you agree with that? We have a choice in the matter, right? But when we submit to his pressing, it, it is akin to what he prayed in the garden, the garden of 
Chamini, the olive press, where those olives were pressed. In fact, some people have theorized that the garden that he prayed in was an, an olive garden that was the trees there were set apart for the sanctuary. And the olives that were growing on those trees were actually the olives that were set apart for the sanctuary and the pressing for the oil for the light. So he chose his place to do this very carefully, it would seem. But he prayed, not my will, your will be done. And I've heard that all my life. You've heard that all your life. And it's one thing to say it, but it's an entirely different matter to be willing to submit to it and go through it. All right, moving on here. Exodus chapter 28, beginning in verse 1. It says, Now take Aaron your brother and his sons with him from among the children of Israel, that he may minister to me as a priest, Aaron and Aaron's sons, Nadav, Avihu, Eleazar, and Itamar. And you shall make holy garments for Aaron your brother, for glory and for beauty. And so you shall speak to all who are gifted artisans, whom I have filled with the spirit of wisdom, that they may make Aaron's garments to consecrate him, that he may minister to me as priest. And these are the garments which they shall make, a breastplate, a nephod, a robe, a skillfully woven tunic, a turban, and a sash. And so they shall make holy garments for Aaron your brother and his sons, that they may minister to me as priests. And again, there's several things mentioned here, and we won't have the time to cover them all, but I wanted to... I wanted to highlight a couple of them. And we'll just start with the general term, holy garments. And let me show you that in Hebrew. Again, I, I know we do a lot of Hebrew, and some people like, why do you do that? But we've got a lot of people that are trying to learn the language, and then just, uh, well, I just like it, so I'm going to do it anyway. <laughs> Let's just put it that way. All right, so the term holy garments is big de kodesh. We're reading from right to left, big de is Beit, Gimel, Dalet, Yud, and then the word Kodesh or Kodesh. It's Kuf, Dalet, Shin. Now, we're going to focus on the word Big Day, which is translated garment. I want to show you the root word, which is Bagad. That's Beit, Gimel, Dalet. That root word means to act covertly, deceitfully, to be faithless. Now, it's kind of interesting to me that a word that means to be faithless, to act in such uh, uh, a very deceitful way, gives us the idea of garments. So here's what comes to my mind. Is it possible that the root word here is linked to the fact that Adam had to be clothed after he had, if you, as it were, acted deceitfully or was faithless in that he ate of the tree that he was told not to eat from. He disobeyed the Creator's command. And before that, even though he was naked, he didn't realize it. So it makes me kind of wonder, was he clothed in something before the fall and then he took and ate of that fruit and something happened and he realized, hey, I'm naked? But the point, once again, is he had to be clothed. So, again, the word for garment here is tied to the idea of being faithless. I believe that Adam functioned in the role of a priest before he fell. And if that's true, and if the priests, the sons of Aaron, were clothed in garments that were for splendor and glory, it makes me wonder how Adam was clothed before he sinned. I hope that you understood what I just tried to point out there. Which, again, is just another hint that before the fall, Adam most likely functioned in the role of a priest. Perhaps he may have even functioned in the role of high priest of a different order. Not the Levitical order, because that comes after the golden calf incident. That's just conjecture, but it's an interesting thing to consider. That the Creator is going to call his priests to set them apart, to consecrate them, and he's going to put garments on them that have a thematic connection to someone who, or something that is being faithless. I think there's a connection there. Because before the golden calf incident, all of Israel was called to be a kingdom of priests. Not just one tribe, but a kingdom of priests. So when 
they acted faithless at the base of the mountain and they took and crafted this, this golden calf and they reveled and they, they, they broke their oath, that's when he called Levi to be set apart. And that's when the sons of Aaron were set apart from them. Anyway, I just see this as, uh, as being connected to what happened in the very beginning. And so if you're going to minister unto me, he says, you're going to have to be clothed in garments that are for splendor and for glory. And once again, we need to keep in mind that you and I are be called to be a kingdom of priests, a royal priesthood, a holy nation. Again, what is our duty, our function? To show forth the praises of him who has called us out of darkness into his light. So, this takes us back to the idea that those who are set apart from those who are set apart from those who are set apart are called to approach him. And to approach him, we have to wear garments that are clean, that are pure, as we stand before him. Who is going to ascend into the hill of the Lord and who shall stand in his holy place? You have to have clean hands. You have to have a pure heart. Now, the ordinary priest, not the high priest, the ordinary priest, my understanding is, wore white linen garments. The high priest, you know, he had all these other things that he would wear almost every day. But then there was one day that he took all of that off and he wore only white linen garments. What day was that? Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement, when he was going to go in, literally go into the presence of the Almighty. And so this speaks to two things. It, accent it accentuates the need for you and I figuratively speaking, that if we really want to draw close to him, we have to be willing to change our garments. We've, we've talked about this a couple of times before. Remember when Jacob's coming back from Syria into the land and he's going to go back to Bethel to keep his vow, he told everybody that was with him, this is in Genesis chapter 35, he told everybody that was with him, you need to clean up and change your garments. When they appeared before the Creator at the foot of Mount Sinai, He said, I'm coming down in three days, so you need to wash your clothes and get ready. Make yourselves clean before you present yourselves to me. That's the implication. So there is this need to change our garments if we're going to appear before the King, if we're going to approach Him. And I say that uh, in my mind with knowing, understanding that every week, as I go through my week and deal with life and deal with situations and deal with people, some of that stuff rubs off on me. You've heard me say how many times I have to go talk to the pine trees a lot. I went and talked to the pine trees a lot this week, all right, a lot, because all that stuff wants to get on me and it wants to pollute me. And so I have to kind of you know, discipline myself. I, before we go in here to Shabbat, before we go into this service and we commune with him and with one another, I need to change my garments, as it were. I need to get, that, get rid of that stuff and not bring it in here. Do you, you hear what I'm saying? And we really have to work at that, don't we, some of us? Not bring all that stuff in here, but leave all that stuff out there. It's just like Joseph. When he was called before Pharaoh, what did he do? He shaved, he washed, he changed his clothes. Why? Because he was going into the king's courtroom. We've got to be willing to leave all of that stuff out there if we're going to approach him. But now going back to the high priest, on Yom Kippur, he would, he would remove all of those other adornments and he would wear only the linen the white linen garment, and yet that white linen garment had to be spotted with blood. Exodus 29, verse 21, he was told to take some of the blood and he was to sprinkle it on Aaron and on his garments. So think of that. It's got to be clean, and yet it's going to be sprinkled with blood. Maybe... Maybe that's to remind us once again that those garments he's wearing, those garments of splendor and glory, harken back to a day when before the fall, man functioned in the role of the priest, but because he was unfaithful, innocent blood had to be shed to make it possible for us to be able to come back into his presence. It's just 
something I thought was kind of interesting, that his garments of splendor, they may be considered holy because they were sprinkled with blood. And of course, this ties us to what Yeshua did on our behalf, Hebrews chapter 9. It says that with his own blood, he entered into the holy place, obtaining redemption for you and I. We understand in Revelation chapter 7 that the saints have washed their robes and made them white, how? In the blood of the Lamb. So these robes that we are to wear, these garments we are to wear, are clean, they're white, and yet they have to be made white with the blood of the Lamb. Now, it, this is just an interesting sidebar. This isn't really necessarily having any bearing on the, the message today, but I, I do find it interesting. I want to read this, this passage for you in Isaiah 63, verse 1. It says, Who is this who comes up from Edom with dyed garments from Botsra? This one who is glorious in his apparel, traveling in the greatness of his strength. And he answers, I who speak in righteousness, mighty to save. And then he's asked, why is your apparel red and your garments like one who treads in the winepress? And then he answers, I have trodden the winepress alone and from the peoples no one was with me. For I have trodden them down in my anger and trampled them in my fury. Their blood is sprinkled on my garments and I have stained all my robes. Do y'all know who's speaking there? Who's speaking there? Yeshua is. You know that gentle little lamb of a man, you know? who's so soft and tender, and what, is, what do we see here? That when he returns, his robes are staying with the blood of his enemies. That's right, the Lion of Judah. All right, let's move on. In Exodus 28, from verses uh, 5 through 8, it describes the ephod. And you will see that the ephod is made of the same material, the same colors, as was the parochet, which the parochet is the veil. And it's probably to get us to see the relationship between the ephod and the veil. Because the veil between the holy place and the most holy place was covering or over the heart of the sanctuary. And so the ephod is going to be, where, where is it going to be worn? Over the heart of the high priest. And here's something I found fascinating. Maybe you'll find it interesting too. As he goes on to describe the ephod and all the different uh, other components of the garments of the high priest, in verse 9, he mentions two stones that are engraved with the tribes of Israel. And it says that these stones are to be for a memorial. Uh, you could say that they are stones of remembrance. And these stones are worn upon the shoulders of the high priest because the high priest was to, upon his shoulders, bear the tribes before the Creator. But the Hebrew word that is translated most often in your Bible as onyx, in Hebrew it's shoam. Show them stones. But again, those two stones have the 12 tribes engraved upon them. And the high priest goes and he bears the, the tribes before the creator upon his shoulders. Because the high priest is the messenger and the representative of the entire community. And that brings this thought to mind. Isaiah chapter 9 verse 6. For unto us a child is born, and unto us a son is given. And the government will be upon his shoulder, and his name will be called Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. And I read that because, of course, it says that the government is going to be upon his shoulder. And I wanted to show you the word for government in Hebrew. It's Mem Sin Resh He, Misra. And it comes from the root word, that you, I know you want to say Sarah, but it's Sarah. Sarah is the root word. Here's what the root word means. To have power, to persevere, to prevail. And if you're ahead of me, you, you're already seeing that this is where we get the idea of Yisrael. Because this is one of the roots that is used to form the name Yisrael, that one who prevails, that one who perseveres, 
And that one who has power, power over what? Yeshua said, I'm going to give you the power and the authority to trample on scorpions and serpents and every power of the adversary. We have that power, we have that authority, but what's also embedded in that is we have the will and the determination to persevere and to prevail, which then connects us back to that little pressing thing. Because my wife is the most disciplined, the most determined person I have ever met in my life. I'm not exaggerating and I'm not trying to patronize. She, there, she's like a lot of other people. She has every right, based on what happened to her growing up, she has every right to be bitter and mad and, and hate the world. But she doesn't. She decided, I'm not going to live that way. I'm not going to let those things determine who I am. And so I've watched over the last 30 plus, 35, 36 years, how she's determined and she's committed and she's disciplined. And it just, sometimes it makes me so mad. Because I'm not that person by nature. My, my nature is, if something happens, I'm out of here to heck with y'all. It is. Probably shouldn't tell you that. But that's who I am. Right, Mrs. Lantry? <laughs> she wouldn't know other than the fact that I've told her. I've, we've, we have a little conversation from time to time about things. No, but that's just my nature. But... So what I've learned from the creator in many ways through my wife is that we have to persevere if we're going to have any kind of power and authority. We're going to have to make up our minds to prevail, as it were. And that's why Jacob goes from being Jacob to Israel. All right. So this concept is embedded in the word for the government that he's wearing upon his shoulders. I think that's very important because the government, the kingdom of Israel, the empire, if you will, is comprised of the 12 tribes. And those 12 tribes that he wears on his shoulder, they have to be those people who determine to persevere, to prevail. You're no longer going to be called Jacob, but Israel because you have prevailed with God and man. And so consequently, I give you the power, the authority to trample on scorpions and serpents and over every power of the adversary. So the high priest, our high priest Messiah, bears the 12 tribes before God as a memorial, indicating that God is continually reminded of the promise that he made the tribes, as if the creator of the universe has to be reminded of anything. But in the scripture, when he remembers someone, when he remembers something, the word actually means he begins to act on behalf of that that he is remembering. And he remembered Noah, and things begin to happen. And he remembered this person, and things begin to happen. When Cornelius was giving alms and offering prayers, he was told that at a certain point, your prayers and your alms have come up before God as a memorial. That meant that the time had come for God to act on his behalf. So there is a time, the high priest bearing those shulam stones on his shoulders, going in before the creator as a memorial, that means that there will come a time that he will begin to act on behalf of those 12 tribes. In fact, Israel, according to Isaiah, feels as if they have been forgotten and have been forsaken. And here's what it says in Isaiah 49, verse 14. But Zion said, the Lord has forsaken me. And my Lord has forgotten me. Can a woman forget her nursing child and not have compassion on the son of her womb? Surely they may forget, yet I will not forget you. See, I have inscribed you on the palms of my hands. Your walls are continually before me. And I read that passage because the names of the tribes were inscribed or engraved on those two shulam stones. He has said that the name of Israel is engraved on the palm of his hand. He's never going to forget. Now, here's why it's important for you and me. We're part of that group. We're part of that family. He's not talking just to somebody that's way over there on the other side of the world. He's talking to you and me today. As a matter of fact, 
in regard to the Shoem stones, even though many times it's translated as onyx stones, most lexicons define this word as being unknown or uncertain. In fact, I found one reference that identified it this way, as the identity stone. As if there is an uncertain way to identify this particular stone. In other words, that to me hints that there is a hidden aspect in accordance with Israel's identity. Let me take it one step further. This Torah portion talks about the breastplate and all the different Jewels or gemstones, 12 gemstones that adorn the chushan or the breastplate. And in the breastplate, instead of using Menashe and Ephraim, it uses Yosef or Joseph. Would you care to take a guess what stone the name Yosef is engraved on as it appears on the chushan? It's a Shoam stone. It's the stone that is translated onyx. But there's a lot of mystery concerning this particular stone. Now, why would Joseph be engraved on the stone, on the breastplate, that identifies as being unidentified? Here's where my mind goes with this. Joseph is a picture of somebody. He's a picture of somebody that he looks one way, but he knows who he is. And, of course, Joseph is ultimately a picture of the Messiah. He was hated by his brethren. He was betrayed by his brethren. He goes into a far country, and he's made to look like them, speak like them. He's married into the Egyptian family, all these different things. But he's in the place that the Creator put him so that in the appropriate time, when everything comes up for a memorial and he remembers his people and begins to act on behalf of his people, he's got the right man in the right place so that all Israel might be saved. You see, most of the world, well, I shouldn't say most of the world, there are a lot of people who don't understand Yeshua as being Messiah, right? But one day that's going to be revealed, right? Right? But if that's a picture of the Messiah, then I'm going to recommend to you, Joseph, is a picture of you and me, too. I don't have time to get into that. Let's just put it this way. Israel is not exclusively determined by genealogies. That was my point. And so you and I are included on those Shoam stones that... Our Messiah, our high priest, bears on his shoulders as a memorial before the Father who will one day, he will remember and he will act. Now I'm going to go back to the Choshen. All of the 12 of those stones on the breastplate were considered to be precious stones. Exodus 19, God's people are regarded as precious stones or a peculiar stone treasure. Israel is his peculiar treasure. Israel is his jewels, as it were. Psalm 135 verse 4 says that the Lord has chosen Jacob for himself and Israel for his special treasure. And that word in Hebrew is something we've talked about quite a a bit, is the word segula. Segula. Peculiar treasure, special treasure, literally jewels. I'm going to read in Malachi chapter 3 where we see this word. Verse 16. Then those who feared the Lord spoke to one another, and the Lord listened and heard them. So a book of remembrance was written before him for those who fear the Lord and who meditate on his name. Let me pause right there. I want my name to be in that book. Because that book of remembrance is those who fear him and who meditate on his name. And this is what he says of those. They shall be mine, says the Lord of hosts. On the day that I make them my jewels, I will spare them as a man spares his own son who serves him. So then when Peter refers to us as being a chosen generation, a peculiar people, 
he is echoing what we see in Exodus 19, and the point would be that that would be synonymous with the idea of us being his segula, his jewels, his precious stones. And precious stones, not necessarily when they come out of the ground, but after they've been cut and you know dealt with a little bit, they sparkle, they shine. And especially if you hold them up to the sun, right? Because when they catch the sunlight, that's when you behold their true beauty. And then they really begin to function in the way that they're supposed to. And I want you to put that, that idea or that thought within this context. The guy that said that we're a chosen generation is the same guy who saw Yeshua transfigured in Matthew chapter 17. And when he saw him transfigured, it says that his face shone like the sun. And what did his garments look like? They were as white as light. So if he's in the midst and we are his precious stones, what do you think would be the result? We would begin to shine. Now, we're not generating our own light. We're just radiating or reflecting his light. Now, so Peter, I can't help but think when he's talking about us being living stones and how we're a chosen generation and he's connecting us to all of that. Remember, he's the guy that saw Yeshua transfigured where his face was shining like the sun. And also, uh, couple this thought with it. One day, we will see him as he is. And what does it mean for you and me? We will be like him. Let's go on. Exodus 28, verse 29. So Aaron shall bear the names of the sons of Israel on the breastplate of judgment. Choshen Mishpat. He shall bear the names of the sons of Israel on the breastplate of judgment over his heart when he goes into the holy place as a memorial before the Lord continually. And you shall put in the breastplate of judgment the Urim Betumim, the Urim and the Thummim, and they shall be over Aaron's heart when he goes in before the Lord. So my understanding is that the breastplate was, um, was square, but it was folded. And when it folded end to end, it made a little pouch. And the, the priest would wear this over his heart. And then within that pouch, at least according to one tradition, is where the Urim the Tumim were placed. And there are different traditions about what it is. And my, my takeaway is that nobody knows for certain. But one tradition is it was a parchment. It had the name of Yudhe Vave on it, and the priest would pronounce that. Uh, varying uh, traditions related to that whole idea. But here's one thing that I believe we can be certain of. It means, that phrase means, lights and perfections, or perfect light. In fact, show them in he, where it looks like in Hebrew. So this is how that phrase appears in Hebrew. Et, which is the sign of the direct object, ha'orim ve'et hatumim. So we know for certain that it had something to do with light, and we know that it had to do with the perfecting of something. And I found it interesting that in the text it says they, not it, but they, which anyway, to me speaks against the idea of it just being a single parchment, but that's just my opinion. But the word urim is the plural form of or, which is light, not perfect. But it's light. Or is the, is the word for light. And so urim is the plural form of that word. Tumim is the equivalent of tamim. Another word we've talked about quite a bit. Do you remember what tamim means? It's without spot or blemish. It's translated different ways. Perfect being one of them. But it, when you get right down to it, it's without spot or blemish. That's the word that describes the Pesach lamb. It's to be a male lamb of the first year with having no defects. 
So that's the idea behind tamim, or in this case, tumim. So we know it has something to do with light, and we know it has something to do with being perfected. Now here's another interesting thing. There is no mention of any artisans, by name anyway, fashioning the urim and the tumim. There are those who believe that urim and tumim is a word whereby the 12 stones on the breastplate are being defined. In other words, instead of it being a parchment in the pouch, there are, there are traditions that those 12 stones collectively constitute the Urim ve Tumim. And I want to just investigate that possibility for just a moment. Number one, we understand that the Urim ve Tumim was a means of communication between the Almighty and His people. If there was a difficult question, they would inquire by the Urim Vetumim. There's not a lot of instances where we see that in the Scripture, but we understand it was a way for them to communicate. Um, go back to that Hebrew phrase for Urim Vetumim. Jonathan, if you don't mind. That was the long Hebrew phrase, if you don't mind. There. Um, we're going to... I want you to look at the word urim without the definite article, the hay in front of it. What letter does it begin with? If you remove the definite, definite article. Aleph. Okay? And look at the word tumim. Remove the definite article, the hay, and what does it begin with? Tav. Aleph, tav. So they would go inquire, if you will, by the aleph, tav. Now, why is that important to me? Because Yeshua identified himself to John on Patmos as the Aleph in Tav. In other words, it's inferring the word of God. So when you want to get a word from God, where do you go? The word of God. All right. I will continue on. Anyway, let's go back to the idea that the Urim Vitumim is, is tied to the 12 stones on the breastplate. And so when... Israel needed to obtain an answer to very important issues. They would, by the priests, they would inquire of the Urim Betumim. Now, one tradition about this as it relates to the stones is that it, when they were inquiring, that certain stones on the breastplate would light up. Some, some traditions say it would light on a particular letter that was in one of those stones or it would light on those stones. But anyway, there was something going on in the breastplate Then they were inquiring. Things would start lighting up and they'd get an answer. Now, I know that sounds a little bizarre, but then, well, I'll come back to that thought perhaps. Let me find my place here. All right. I... I wrestled with whether or not I should do this. I'm going to do it. There is a legend, and I want to underscore that word legend, that when it came to fashioning the menorah, and, and when Moses got the pattern for this, and he went to Betzalel and Aholiab to fashion the menorah, that according to this legend, on the seven branches of the menorah were the 22 letters of the Hebrew Aleph Bet. On the different branches so like the the branch to the right or to the east would have three letters and then the next branch would have three letters and how do i know it would have three letters well 21 divided by okay or 22 i'm sorry 22 divided by seven means every branch gets three letters but one branch is going to get an extra one right are you with me okay all right, so three branch, uh, one branch, three letters, another branch, three letters, another branch, three letters. So we get to the middle branch. Which one of those branches do you think is going to get the extra letter? Logically, the middle one, right? And so then we, as we continue with the other three, they get three letters. So again, this is a legend. But here's what happens when you do that. The four um, letters that would end up being on the middle branch, if you will, the Shamish branch, are the letters Yud, Chaf, Lamed, Mem. Can you show that for me, Jonathan? Yud, Chaf, Lamed, Mem. Marcy, yes, sir. tell me what that word means. Uh, it means he will complete them or he will finish them. He will right. He will complete them or he will finish. Um, I like to put it, he'll finish what he started. He's going to make things, everything, the way it should be. In fact, um, it, it, it even implies everyone, like everybody included. 
but he's going to complete them. He's going to finish them. So again, that word, that word that would be formed on the middle branch or the shamash branch of the menorah means he will complete or he will finish them. Now, if I read those letters in reverse order, mem, lamid, chaf, yud, then I see who's going to do this. Malchi, my king. Because who stands in the midst of the seven golden candles, candlesticks? Our king. Who, who bears the tribes upon his shoulders as he goes before the Father to, as a memorial? Who's doing it? It is our king. So the high priest wore this breastplate. Back to the legend now. He wore this breastplate, and as he stood before the menorah, because remember, we know it has something to do with light, and what's the only thing that gives light in the sanctuary? The menorah. All right? That he would stand before the menorah, and as he would stand before the menorah, that the light from the menorah would illuminate these different stones or letters within those stones, and that's how the priest would get his answer. That's one tradition, but here's why I'm saying it. This is why I wanted to bring it out. Would Israel get an answer to their question if there was no oil in the lamp? So how important was it that there be oil in that lamp? Because no oil, no light. And if there's no light, Theoretically speaking, there is no answer. So how important then, let's follow that up with this. How important was it for that all 12 of those stones be in their proper place? I mean, what if some of the stones were missing? What if some of the stones were scattered about? They weren't where they were supposed to be. Could the high priest get a conclusive answer. The potential is there to get an incomplete answer or maybe even a faulty answer, right? And then you go do something you're not supposed to. Now we're dealing in, you know, speculations here. But I'm trying to make a point. How important is it for you and I to submit ourselves to being pressed by our high priest? How important is it that we may produce that pure, uncontaminated oil because that provides the fuel for the light. Now, he's the source of the light, but he needs that person or persons that are willing to produce the fuel for that light. Because from the beginning, who has he chosen to work in and through? His people from the very beginning of time. So when there's no oil, and that means there's nobody willing to be pressed, then Theoretically speaking, there's no light. And when it comes time for his people to get answers to their dilemmas and their questions in the midst of crisis, it's really important that that light is there. But it's also important to see that all of those stones have to be in their proper place. Because if they aren't, again, you may get an inclu inconclusive answer. You may get an answer that's faulty. So... All of these things are quite important. So then it's interesting to me that after the days of David, when the kingdom was divided, there is no mention of the Urim Vetumim. Now, that might be a coincidence, or it might be telling us something, that if when the kingdom is divided and stones are scattered, it's kind of difficult to get a complete answer. It's kind of difficult to get a complete overview of things. So where are we going with this? There's a day when David's fallen tabernacle is going to be set up. The breaches are going to be closed up. And he says, I will restore it as in days of old. So that's where you and I come in. I'm of the, I'm of the opinion that the light that Israel, that God's people are supposed to be, has never has never been fully realized. I think there have been times when it's burned brighter than others, but I'm of the opinion that it's never burned the way it was supposed to be. The light was supposed, the way the light was supposed to be. Brandon's like... 
everybody? All right, I'm going to talk really loud. It seems to be the day for that. <laughs> All right, can you bring me up, Brand? All right, well, this is on. I'll try this one now. Okay, all right. Sorry about that, folks. All righty. Let, let me just go to that slide, um, Jonathan, with the word Hoshan on it. Can you do that? The word Hoshan or breastplate? There you go. Let me just go ahead and go to this. All right, on the, on the far left is the word for breastplate, choshen. Every Hebrew word has a numerical equivalent. And the numerical equivalent of choshen is 358, which is also the numerical value of the word Mashiach. So what is the implication in this? That all of these things that we've been talking about ultimately will point us to the Messiah. Right? But where is that breastplate worn? It's over his heart. Right? Now, on that choshen or on that breastplate are 12 stones, precious stones. That's what you and I are supposed to be. That's what is representing you and me because those 12 tribes represent the whole family. Remember, on the middle branch, he's going to complete them. He's going to make them whole. He's going to put things back the way they're supposed to be. Who's going to do this? Well, our king is going to do this. So what is on his heart? Restoration. Bringing the family back together, putting things back the way they're supposed to be. Who's against that? Our adversary. He doesn't want that to happen because if he can prevent that from happening, what doesn't occur? That light that we are supposed to be is always going to be diminished somewhat. But when we do our part, when we are willing to submit to the pressing so that we might produce that pure oil that becomes the fuel for that light, when we're willing to do our part and deny ourselves and say no to our will, then that is, puts us one step closer to these things being realized. And so we, I'll conclude with this. We are certain that what is on the Messiah's heart is restoration and that all of his people being back in the place that they're supposed to be, being and serving their function. In John chapter 11 and Ephesians chapter 2, in the scripture, it tells us the reason he died was to bring things back together. I'm just summarizing that. But you and I have a responsibility in this as well. Would it be fair to say that, generally speaking, God's people through the ages have, have kind of gone about this as far as performing his will as a people? It's been kind of hit and miss. Would you, would you see that that's accurate? Would you agree with that assessment? This has kind of been hit and miss. And sometimes it seems we take two steps forward and one step back. And, you know, sometimes we get off in the weeds and it takes us a little while to kind of get back on the main path. And it's, it's just been a lot of uncertainty, a lot of uh, uh, wrong conclusions. Well, that's because, you know, all the stones aren't where they're supposed to be. The light isn't what it's supposed to be, whereby we get a clear answer. So my, my hope in this, this morning is that we will understand that even though all of these things are pointing us to the Messiah as our heavenly high priest, that you and I have a responsibility in this as well. And it begins with us submitting ourselves and allowing him to press us in a way that we can produce that which is fuel for his light. That we understand that what is on his heart is restoration and that all his people are where they're supposed to be 
that he has finished them, he's completed them, he's made them whole. And that when we are in that situation, that's when we can truly and effectively and completely reflect his light. And so in Isaiah 60, it says, Arise, shine, for your light is come, and the glory of the Lord is risen upon you. Darkness will be upon the nations, deep darkness the peoples, but the Lord will arise over you, and his glory shall be seen upon you. This morning, uh, for whatever reason, it's been um, difficult to get the brain to work with the mouth. But here's what I want you to hear if you don't hear anything else I say. We have really come into a time where I believe that all the things that the prophets have written are converging. We, have, we are in a place and a time when the darkness is unprecedented as far as anything you and I have seen. We can read about some things in the Bible, but as far as what you and I have seen... I would say it's unprecedented. And all these things are beginning to converge, which tells me that it is time for us to arise and shine, to take off the dirty garments, all of the stuff from our past, all the things, the experiences that we've dealt with, all the things that have polluted our robes. If we are going to walk into his presence in the way that his light can truly reflect on our lives, we've got to be willing to lay those things down and set them aside, be like... Yehoshua was the high priest who changed his garments. He put a new turban on his head. Even Yeshua, before he ascended to his father, said to the women, you can't handle me right now. Why? Because I'm about to go into the presence of the father. And if he acknowledges that, how much more should we acknowledge? It is time for us to be willing not in word, but in deed, submit ourselves to allow him to continue pressing us that we might be the fuel for his light and that we are committed to dying to ourselves that all of his people might come together. It's not going to be based on Jacob's tent solely, I understand that, but Jacob's tent has to do its part. And the next congregation has to do its part. And this assembly has to do its part. Father, I'm going to leave it in your hands. I pray, Father, that the words that have been spoken, that your people will hear your word in it. And I pray, Father, that the message that's been given, that your people will hear your message in it. And I pray this, Father, that you will give each and every one of us the opportunity to demonstrate whether or not we truly mean when we say, not my will, but your will be done. That we can truly produce that oil that is pure and unpolluted. That we can be that polished gem that's been cut, it's been polished, and it is ready to be set in its place. And that every stone and, and all that that represents, that, Father, you would assemble us and cause us to be that people that are true to the call, to be a light to the nations. Father, we pray that we will commit ourselves to laying aside the filthy garments, that we might put on clean garments, that we might put on those garments that are appropriate to attend the wedding, that we will be welcome guests, that we will be welcome participants, that we can be in your presence. And finally, Father, I just pray that for the rest of this day, that you will lead and guide, that you will help us, Father, to focus our attention on your purposes and not our agendas, that you'll help us, Father, to die more today than we did yesterday to our own will and our own agenda so that your purposes can be fulfilled in us. We pray these things, and we believe you for them in Yeshua's name. Amen. Beth, will you come, and uh, if you have any prayer requests to share with us?
we had a lot of prayer requests Wednesday, and uh, it was a pretty long list, so I'm going to um, just skip ahead to the newer ones that have come in. But I would invite you to go back and look at um, Wednesday's service, the live stream, if you want to um, check out the prayers there, and also go to the prayer page on the Jacob's Tent. Um, but is it okay if I take just a minute before I do the prayer requests? I kind of put him on the spot. He should be used to that after all these years. <laughs> He's laughing. It's a good thing. Anyway, on our way in this morning, um, as usual, we're praying. Um, and last week, you know, I was very thankful. It just seemed to be impressed on my heart, the um, consistency of our Father, that he does not change ever. And the comfort that that gives us, the confidence that that gives us, and the peace that that gives us. And we see it every year in the changing seasons. Um, and then I was impressed with that again today, and I guess because we're coming into springtime, change of seasons and everything. And remember, uh, I think tonight the time changes, right? Time changes, but he does not. Anyway, um, as I was praying on the way in, I just felt that peace and joy were the focus today. And I feel like we're entering into a new season of peace and joy for everybody here individually as well as corporately for Jacob's Tent. And it's just amazing to me how throughout the week the Holy Spirit just weaves little things together that we don't even see. And then we get here on Shabbat and he makes it one nice big pretty bow to just complete the package and draw it all together for us. So when we were singing this morning, um, after I was, I was impressed about the peace and joy, um, and I'm, I'm really, a lot of different things happened that people have shared with us this week, and I'm, I'm seeing a lot of blessings on our children. You know, these three right here included, one that's still hidden, but you'll see her soon. Um, but they had blessings this week. Zuriel had blessings this week. Others of you have shared blessings that your children have had. And I'm very thankful. And I think this is a part of that season of peace and joy. Because when we see our children blessed, does it not bless our heart? And if we can be part of that blessing for them, it makes it even better. And so how much more does the Father desire to bless us? And how much more excited, if we can apply that word to him, is he when he sees us recognize that blessing and then thank him for it. So during praise and worship, I see so many different things. And as they were singing that song, um, Dance With Me, the, uh, I was seeing the children who once danced to the, these praise songs returning and dancing again. And this is something that I had seen over here in this section, the very first service that we had here. So I know that's coming. And then... Barry Goodson had no idea what was going on in my heart, what the Father was showing me. And um, for those of you who don't know Barry, he's one of our live streamers, love streamers, who um, actually had a stroke and was, you know, looking kind of dim there for a little while. But now, instead of being months to rehabilitation, he's weeks. And that's a, a huge praise. But he had posted around the same time dance dance yes he will dance again not just walk and be healed but he will dance and maybe with us here at jacob's tent so it's just another little silver thread weaving through so thank you for that barry and we're praying for you for your healing to be i mean goodness it's already been rapid but even faster and the father can do that so i just i wanted to share that with you and then i i feel impressed to share a little story bill always tells stories so i have a little story and I feel that this is for somebody. It definitely ministered to me. So I don't know. I think I told you guys a while back about my two hammock trees. Um, and uh, no, you're not in trouble. <laughs> you're not in trouble. There were two trees. Well, kind of a little bit. There were two trees, and I, the only two on this hill out at our house. And I had the hammock between the two trees. And um, it was the only place I could put the hammock because we took so many down. So... It was down, the hammock was not out there anymore, and Bill and Alan thought this would be the perfect place to put a target on one of my hammock trees. And, because it shoots you know, way down into the gully there, nobody's down there, it's safe. 
And I saw what they had done when I came home one day. There's this big target on the board or something out there they had put up and it's riddled with holes. And I said, what are y'all doing to my hammock tree? You're going to kill it. No, it'll be fine. I said, you're shooting it full of holes, not just one or two. It's going to die. No, it'll be fine. He and Alan were just, it's fine. It's a great target spot. So I knew the tree was already dead. The tree didn't know it. They wouldn't admit it, but the tree was dead. It's just a matter of time. So what happens? Not long after that, a storm comes through. And what happens to my tree? Boom. And where did it land? Right on the fence. So I waited and waited, and I thought, we're going to have to fix that. The dogs are going to get out. The dogs got out. I thought, we're going to have to fix that. And Alan has it on his to-do list. He really wants to get that fixed. That was at the top of his list. So um, yesterday... We had a situation where somebody was going to be out and I needed to make sure, we needed to make sure that the fence was fixed because the dogs would definitely get out and it wouldn't be a good situation. So, guess who got to go fix the fence? So, here's what's going through my mind when I'm out there. I'm tugging on this fence. Okay, let me back up just a little bit. I went to try to start the chainsaw. Of course, it wouldn't start. Okay? I went to, I thought about the tractor, but it was kind of on a hill and I'm just not that brave. I'll go pretty much anywhere on the tractor, but not sideways because I don't want to roll it. So I'm thinking, okay, God, I have all these great things, these mechanical things that would make this job done in like 30 seconds. I could have just zipped that tree one time with a chainsaw, thrown it down the hill, and it'd be done. Nope. So I had to get the ax out and go and chop the tree in half off of the fence. And not only that, but I'm in a time crunch because Shabbat's coming. And we have all kinds of things that have to be fixed. And this man here, <laughs> it's amazing the things that come at him when he is trying to get his outline ready for Shabbat. So I just thought I'm not even going to bother him. It's just going to be done when he gets home. So I'm out there. And so this is that human side of me that creeped in there for a minute. I said, you know, I'm the one who said don't put that up there and shoot this tree. I'm the one who said it's going to kill the tree. I'm the one who said it's going to fall on the fence. They all denied it or said no or said it'll be okay. And now I'm the one out here fixing the fence. I said, Father, am I stupid? What's wrong with me? Why don't I have them out here fixing the fence? And the father just said, you know, Beth, there's a lesson in this for you. No, you didn't make the tree fall. You didn't do the things leading up to that. You tried to save the tree. You tried to warn them that death would happen <laughs> and beyond death destruction would happen my fence got torn up but there are those times when you know, we don't cause the situation but we're called to fix the situation and it just you know, where I wanted to be a little irritated especially since I was in a time crunch I just backed up and I was like I, I said father Forgive me, because how many times do I make a, a situation that's horrible? How many times do I create something that is, makes it difficult for somebody else or difficult for you to bless me or my family, yet you fix it? You, you come in and you fix it. And you don't fuss at me. And you don't get bitter with me. Maybe he gets irritated. I, he probably should. I'll stand first in that line for him to be irritated with. But... That is the compassion and the love and the long-suffering of our Father. Now, that was just a fence. Yeah, it's fixed now and everything is good. But the message is in our attitude and how we look at things and how the Father does stuff for us. When we don't deserve for Him to do it, He comes in and, in and He fixes the situation. So if He can do that for us, how much more should we do that for each other? So I just wanted to share that little story um, just to encourage you that there are times when you may be called on to fix a situation that you didn't create. We still need to do that joyfully. He has a purpose even in that, and I think sometimes that's part of the squeezing. So anyway, hope somebody got something out of that. <laughs> I should have asked for help. <laughs> Um, I, I think I was the only one there. <laughs> yeah. Oh, call somebody. Okay. Well, if you could find my house, that would be a miracle in itself. But next time, maybe I'll call somebody. So anyway.
Um, let's move on to our prayer requests. Um, well, in addition to Barry's praise report of how well he's doing, how he is progressing so much quicker than the doctors thought he would, that is amazing. They were saying, you know, three to six months. Now they're saying weeks. So that's just a testimony of what the Father can do. And uh, Barry, is he just has a great attitude. If you've seen him online this morning, he's just so encouraging, even while he's somewhat down. Um, Candace, we're so thankful that she had a good surgery. We're so thankful that Ms. Gwen is here today after her surgery and that the Father is just touching and healing. And I just want you to know, even while Gwen was still recovering, she's the one who took Candace to have her surgery. So I love to see how our family helps each other. Um, we have the Hartmans, Ed and his wife, who are um, on staff over at the Church of God of Prophecy. They're the ones that we rent the room for for Passover and that we had our Hanukkah conference there. He and his wife are both dealing with cancers, right? Are they currently in treatment, both of them? Okay. So if you would lift up the Hartmans, um, he's a precious man. He has been so wonderful to work with us, to rent that room there, to accommodate us in every way. And... I would just really love for our family to pray for him and his family. This, it cannot be easy. Also, we need to pray for the tornado victims. That was on the list Wednesday, but um, that's far-reaching and long-lasting, so we need to pray for all of them. It's also a praise for uh, people that have had messages that the tornado went right over their house, you know, destroy stuff on either side, and their house was fine. Um, I thank the Father for that protection. I, you know, but we do need to pray for the people on either side of those people. And then just a, a couple more. Um, Jacqueline Smith would like for us to pray for her. She is uh, having breast cancer surgery Monday. So she is in New York in the um, Oneida area. And so I just pray for her. And if you guys will just lift her up. Well, one says Oneida and one says Clinton. So um, I'm not sure how close those are. I'm geographically challenged. Um, there's another request from um, Jaken Maxwell. This one is heartbreaking to me. She is watching, and she gave me permission to say this. She's watching her daughter make decisions that are potentially placing her granddaughter in danger. She's very concerned, and the um, agencies that could do something about it won't until there's been an incident and she wants there to not be an incident that's harmful to her granddaughter so if y'all will pray for jake and pray for her for her daughter whose name is elise and for the little girl for god's protection on on her and for there to be healing in the situation for the daughter to come back to her rightful place with the lord and then the last one i'll stop after this um some of our live streamers are, um, I thought I had her name here. Okay. Bill is having, um, heart troubles. He is in the ICU in college station, Texas at, with end stage heart failure and kidney failure. And he's, uh, he's only 64. So they're facing some difficult situations. So if you will, just, just lift them up. And of course we want to still pray for Brad Scott. Um, like I said, go to the Jacobs temp prayer page. Um, there's, we have a lot of prayer requests, but we have a lot of answered prayers too. So I just want you to know, we're not just standing up here asking for prayer. You know, we're praying and we're seeing things happen. So be a part of that. And that goes for you online, our Jacob's Tent um, live stream love streamers. Okay, if you will stand and we'll go ahead and pray. Father, we're so thankful. We're so humbled that we can even stand before you and bring our petitions to you. We're so thankful that you do things for us that we know we could never earn, we could never deserve. But you love us so much, Father, that you shower us with blessings and love, with protection, with gifts of peace and joy. We ask you now, Father, to hear the petitions we bring before you today for the ones that were mentioned here, the ones that we don't have time to read off, Father, all the ones that are on the prayer page, all the ones that come through email, and those that are spoken here 
um, personally, uh, parents praying for children to be healed. Um, Father, I just pray that you would touch every one of your children and minister in the way that only you can do. You know everything. You, you knit us together from the very beginning, every cell, every molecule of our whole being. You know it inside and out. I thank you for the healings that are occurring, not just physically, Lord, but I thank you for the request or the um, praise report that came in of the, the two sons that are uh, back in right relationship with their family and how they're adding onto their house to create a space for people in their area to come and be with you and worship and, and learn of you, Father. I just thank you for that, all of the healings taking place. And so, Lord, the ones that we bring to you today, we pray for your healing in all of those situations. Every one of them, Father, we lift them up to you knowing that you have perfect knowledge of what is needed and you have a perfect answer. And just help us to know what our part is in it and to accept your will in all of these situations and to be disciplined to hear your word and to follow it out so that we can continue in walking in the healing and that we can grow in strength and power and that we can withstand the pressing when it comes. Sometimes it's through physical means, sometimes it's relational, sometimes it's spiritual. You have the answer to every single one. And we just thank you that we can rest in your arms knowing you will do what you said you will do. You began the good work and yes, you will be faithful to complete it. So we trust you, Father. We put ourselves right in the palm of your hand, Father. Draw us close to your heart. Let us hear your heart beat and be in tune with you, Abba. This is all we want in Yeshua's precious name. Amen. And at this time, those of you who have prepared and have a willing heart, if you want to bring your offering forward in the basket over here or over here, and then as soon as as soon as we do that, we'll have the ironic benediction. Father, we thank you for these offerings that have been brought forward. We thank you, Father, for, um, we just thank you for your goodness to us. And I pray, Father, you will help us to know how to use and what to use to further your purposes for this congregation and how your will might be carried out. Father, we, we consider these offerings to be set apart for your purposes alone, and we we appeal to you for the wisdom and knowing what to do as we uh, try to um, go forward and um, according to your timetable, according to your purpose, that everything that you purpose for us to fulfill as a group will be accomplished. So again, we thank you for these offerings. We thank you, Father, again, for the opportunity to come into your house and to commune with you today. And we just pray that in, for the rest of the day, as we break bread with one another, as we share thoughts with one another, that in all things you will be sanctified and Yeshua will be lifted up. Amen. Just remain standing, please. Shout. 
Be seated for just a moment. Um, we're just going to wait for the... Are we good? Oh, okay. Well, then... Well, I was just waiting for the that we're ready for Oneg, but Zarek says that we're ready. So, you said you had a quick announcement. Sorry. Now, we have a lot of guests here today. Uh, if you're... I see some still in here somewhere in the nursery. Um, so if you are a guest who's still in here, help pass the word and the rest of the family pass the word to the guests. I think we have um, Bashem or some of you guys here today. Is that? Yeah. Okay. I'm hearing them out there. Some of them say yes. So anyway, um, if you will help them know the ropes um, and just to let you know, we do have classes afterward during Midrash. Jacob's quiver, as well as Miss Nayla's class. So we'll, after prayer, I mean, after we eat, we'll come in here for prayer, and then we will um, dismiss you guys according to the age groups. Um, dance classes at 2.30 in here. And then the only other thing I wanted to announce right quick was, and some of you ladies online, I don't know if we're still in the live stream, but the ladies' luncheon has been moved to the 16th so we could secure a room where we could actually meet. 16th, right? Okay. So um, go ahead and email us and let us know you're coming. But anyway, I just wanted to make sure that got out there. It was in the newsletter, but I know some of you don't read that. So anyway. Let's all stand one more time. Baruch Adonai Eloheinu Melech HaOlam Borein Puri HaGafen Amen Blessed are you, O Lord, our God, King of the universe, who creates the fruit of the vine, and for giving us Yeshua, the Messiah, who said, I am the vine, and you are the branches. L'chaim. All righty, we have a double portion today. Join me, please. Baruch atah Adonai, Eloheinu melech haolam, Hamotzi lechem min haaretz. Amen. Blessed are you, O Lord our God, King of the universe, who brings forth bread from the earth, and forgiving us, Yeshua, the Messiah, who said, I am the bread of life. Amen. I wasn't sticking my hand in that mouth. <laughs> All right. So we'll let these ladies get out the door with the, the challah. I want to make sure that anyone who needs, if you have a walker or a cane,